Welcome uh, and good evening. My name is Robert Dijkraaf, Director of the Institute for Advanced Study, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this uh, lecture by Cédric Villani, and a warm welcome to you, Cédric, back to the Institute here. Um, uh, it's quite a challenge to uh, introduce our speaker. You know, he's definitely a very distinguished mathematician. He's a professor at the Université Lyon. He's director of the Institut Henri Poincaré. That's a, a wonderful mathematics center in the, uh, in the center of Paris. He's extremely distinguished. He um, got the, uh, the Fields Medal. Um, uh, uh, I will say a word more about that, um, which is one of the highest honors you can get in mathematics. Um, uh, but he's also uh, a phenomena in the sense that he's in, uh, in a uh, remarkable way to capture both, I think, the public attention uh, of mathematics without in any way diluting, I feel, what uh, makes mathematics so appealing uh, to uh, a professional mathematician. Um, but, um, and he's actually, uh, today is the first day of a tour he's doing uh, uh, um, around his new book, Birth of a Theorem. And actually, uh, we're quite honored that uh, this occasion is kind of the official, more or less the official start of it. So it's downhill from here. So <laughs> uh, uh, but it's very appropriate because it's, uh, he describes not only beautifully his work leading up to the, uh, to, to the, to the, the theorems that he proved uh, that would be honored in such a great way about nonlinear Landau damping. But the book is also, I could almost say, kind of a love song to the Institute. Uh, in fact, I would say that Siddiq, you probably have written the most, uh, the kind of uh, platonic report. You know, members here at the Institute are uh, uh, asked to write a report sharing their experiences uh, during their stay. And I think Cédric wrote kind of the platonic version. Uh, I quote a few lines of it. He starts with, I arrived at the IES with two major research projects. And then within, within six months, both projects were completed. Writing up the paper on Lando damping was one of the most intense experiences of my professional life. For three months in a row, we kept unlocking seemingly untractable obstacles on a weekly basis. Our 180 page long paper solves a 50 year old problem. Most of the second project was also done during my stay. Actually, in February, we're still striving to construct a counterexample to the theorem, which we ended up proving in June. All in all, I'm leaving parts out, about 250 pages were written, making my stay at the IES one of the most productive periods ever. To summarize, the goal of this day even have fulfilled beyond my best expectations. I'm looking forward to my next visit, and that's now. So, we, you know, it's <laughs> great expectations. You're, I think you're only here a day, but expect at least uh, a major theorem. Uh, um, the said, no, his, um, his, his book really captures and is the way he reaches out in many efforts in France and across the world, um, the, uh, the character of mathematics. And I like the particular fact in an interview, recent interview with The Guardian, Cédric discussed the importance of collaborations in mathematics, stating one of the greatest misconceptions about mathematics is its solitary activity, in which you work with your pen alone in a room. But the fact it's a very social activity, you constantly seek inspiration in discussion encounters and randomness and chance and so on. And I think these are the things we really try, of course, to provide here. As I said, its extraordinary contributions to the field have led to many awards and honors, including the Fermat Prize and the Henri Poincaré Prize of the International Association of Mathematical Physics. Cédric received his PhD from the École Normale Supérieure in 1998 in Paris, where he was subsequently a professor from 2000 to 2010. He also held professorships at the University of Berkeley and Georgia Tech. Um, today, he will explore, uh, we see the wonderful title, uh, the predicate arrangement of planets over extremely long periods and why this idea has been debated for centuries by Newton, Lagrange, Kolmogorov and uh, Tremaine here, Scott Tremaine here at the, at the Institute. At the end of the lecture, we'll have a Q&A period, as always, and then we have a reception in Fuld Hall. Uh, Institute has parted, partnered with the local bookstore to make copies of his new book available. Uh, you can see them outside and also during the reception of the common room. Again, uh, enough pressure on our speaker. And uh, just, just uh, uh, I hope you share me in welcoming Cédric Villani to the stage. So today's title, as Robert uh, mentioned, was uh, made in such a way that it is appealing for very wide audience, planets, stars, and eternity. If it had been for specialized audience, the title would be on the long time behavior of some 
classical mechanical systems. And uh, it will be the same in the end, just presented a bit differently. Now, Robert was uh, mentioning of all my efforts for public standing in France about mathematics and explaining what is about the mathematical research and so on. And how do you convince young people to go and study mathematics? It very much depends on the mood and the uh, character of the people you are talking to. Some of them will like to think of it as job opportunity. And it's great for us that mathematician today is a highly looked at uh, job to the point that Wall Street Journal ranked mathematician as number one job in the world in 2009. See here the poor lumberjack so sad and the mathematician so happy. Actually, in 2014, the same team, the same ranking was done. Now this is called CareerCast. It's a, a company specializing in job market and so on. And they arrived at the same conclusion, 2014, mathematician, best job in the world. What can you ask more? For some, well, by the way, there are some lumberjack people or sons of lumberjack or daughters of lumberjack, don't worry about these stupid rankings. <laughs> Just care about the number one rank here. <laughs> Other people will be more impressed by the range of applications. And here also it's remarkable that so many current technological devices and great projects are using mathematics nowadays. And also older mathematics, like Fourier analysis, as was explained last uh, at the past International Congress of Mathematicians to a delighted audience by a Stanford professor, Emmanuel Candès, all well, good old Fourier transform combined with new mathematics can be used to improve the capture of information in a airman, in a scanner, to the point that you get important applications, reducing the time that people have to spend in there for the measurement and so on. To the point also that the artificial heart, which was a big, so much big news a couple of years ago, also uses a good dose of mathematics. I remember a session at the French Academy of Sciences where Professor Carpentier was presenting his invention and explaining there is a lot of stuff in there, including a lot of mathematics. And it's beautiful time for mathematicians that we are so much in the news on the front of technological progress. Other people will be interested in what mathematics can do as when it comes to artistic realizations. And here also it's great time. For instance, this is picture of the Louis Vuitton Foundation, which was inaugurated last year in Paris. It was a world big thing. And uh, this by uh, architect uh, from Gary, this building could never have been designed, devised without modern mathematics. Actually, 20 years ago, the mathematics in the software there was not perfected enough to allow this building because you cannot do this without a complete virtual simulation of what it will be like. Otherwise, your building will just collapse. But other people will just think the most important is mathematics as a way to understand the world and access some truth and some beauty, and they will not care if it has application or whatever. And this fascination of mathematics as explaining is captured, for instance, in this piece in this painting by John Wright of Derby. A philosopher giving a lecture on the orrery in which a lamp is put in place of the sun. By the way, I uh, stole to Scott Tremaine the idea of using this picture in public lectures. I remember attending a lecture of his just a few meters away and he was using this as first 
picture of his presentation and I thought this is a great idea to start a lecture with this picture when it deals with astronomy. You see, this painting uh, was a lot of buzz when it was out, when it was painted, because it was not a political or religious scene or something like this. It was just a family scene with science represented and the illumination of science and look. So here already is a device that reproduces the trajectories of planets. And here a lamp has been put in the place of the sun, which gives an opportunity for the painter to see the illuminated faces of the children who are so happy to learn about the mysteries of the universe. And the fact that it is with astronomy also is interesting since this is one of the fields in physics that were most early uh, motivations for developing some parts of mathematics and still nowadays, this is one of the subjects that attracts people from wide audience most when it comes to mathematics and applications to astronomy. So let's go with this in this lecture, not worry about any application, but understanding the behavior of the world around us, and in particular, the planets, the sun, the stars, whatever. One of the first elaborate mathematical representations of the solar system goes back to Ptolemaeus. In his book Almagest, he has a, a wonderful description of the trajectories of the planets which were known at the time. The Greeks had a tremendous problem to solve. They were fascinated by the motion of stars and planets. Planets were wandering. This was a big problem. Stars always go in some definite direction, but the planets, they would go sometimes this way, sometimes that way, etc. They had this idea that in the sun it was all perfect, and since the circle is a perfect shape, the motions of the stars had to be descripted, described by circles. And obviously that's not compatible with the vision of uh, planets going in one way and the other. So, Ptolemaeus, in a very ingenious move, considered it was combinations of circles. And he needed to describe the planets at the time, 40 of these epicycles, which were combinations of circular motions. It's easy to find this naive in retrospect. On the contrary, one can find this very clever. Why not see it as an ancient precursor of Fourier analysis, which, as we know, says that any periodic function can be approximated by a combination of uniform circular motions, which are, when you project them, sine and cosine functions. For instance, here is a function which looks anything ordinary, nothing particular, but in fact it's just a combination of four sine functions. And in the same way, Ptolemy kind of found a way to describe in terms of a rather limited number of circular functions, the complicated wandering behavior of the planets. Let's make a big leap forward in time and turn to another description of the solar system. Copernicus, 16th century, in his contribution, puts the center in the sun, in the sun, in the, in the center of the universe, and it still does not solve everything. Using the data of his time, Copernicus still needs epicycles, but less epicycles than Ptolemaeus. And his description is simpler and in this sense more convincing with the idea that where it's the simplicity will be associated with beauty and with truth, <coughs> like in the Occam principle. So that was a progress. But a huge progress arrives later with Kepler. At the end of the 16th century, when he establishes the three laws of Kepler that we still teach our children in school. By the way, if you try to read Kepler in the text, it's very difficult, very complicated, sometimes looks like crazy, very mystic point of view, and uh, it was in France Voltaire who did a big work of translating the 
complicated and confused works of Kepler into something rational and simple, the three laws. What do they say? First law, trajectory of a planet is an ellipse, not a circle, not a combination of circles, but an ellipse. Ellipse is this figure so easy to draw in which you take a rope, you attach it to two points, one here and one there. These are the foci, foci I don't know how you pronounce it, the foyer. And uh, uh, then you kind of draw the set of points which you achieve, which you obtain by uh, making the rope in this way, something which is tense, and going around like this, you see, here, there, and then, and this describes an ellipse. So from any point on the ellipse, the distance to this point plus the distance to that point is a constant. As in here, uh, from any point, the blue line from this, from one point to this first focus plus the distance from this point to the second focus will be a constant. And this draws an ellipse. Uh, it's remarkable that when you think about it, the Greeks knew very well the ellipses. They knew very well the problems of the planet's trajectory, but never occurred to them that these were the same, that one was a solution of the other, showing that mathematics, in a way, is really written in the laws of nature. So this is first law of Kepler. Second law of Kepler, the motion is not uniform, but there is something which is uniform. It's the area which is swept. Which area? Take the sun here at one focus. This is the ellipse. And the planet will go around the ellipse. And when the planet goes from here to here, the area in blue is something which is swept. In the triangle which is formed by the sun, the planet at an early stage and the planet at the later stage. And this area gives you the speed. So in this picture, the area of this A region is the same as the B region. And so the time it takes to the planet to go from here to there is the same as to go from here to there, showing that the motion is faster here than here. So even if the motion is not uniform, there is something which is uniform. And the third law of Kepler is that there is a relation between the distances and the times. Here T is the period that it takes for the planet to go around the sun. And A is called semi-major axis, but you can take it as the mean distance of the planet to the sun. And the square of the period is in proportion to the cube of the distance. So taking the Earth as a unit, if on one column you write down the planetary years, on the other, the mean distances to the sun, then the square of the numbers on the left will be the same as the cubes of the numbers on the right. Beautiful third law. Now with these three laws, you have the complete description of the motions of the planets, that is from the time of Kepler, solving the problem of the Greeks, and a special moment in our vision of the universe. The moment where it was the most simple, and the most pure, before it was complicated with all these epicycles, and after it is complicated also, as we will see in a moment. But at the Kepler time, it is so simple and neat. Let's continue and arrive at the next remarkable mathematical contribution. This is Newton. Publishes in 1684 this law of universal gravitation. He waited almost 20 years before publishing it, after he had found it, which is interesting to recall at the time in which people and young researchers are encouraged to publish very, very quickly. So Newton discovered this, that you can summarize all the Kepler laws into just one law, that there is a force and that the force is like the mass times the attraction, times the acceleration, sorry. And the attraction force between two planets 
is proportional to the product of the masses. This is the mass of the big one, for instance, and this is the mass of the small one, divided by the square of the distance between them. And he says, this is universal. It's not that it's about planets or about the sun. It's any time you have some object with a mass, another object with a mass, they will attract each other. And with this single law, he finds that the three laws of Kepler are consequence of this. By the way, if you believe that there is a certain force which has to be uh, expressed in terms of the distance, it has to be this one. From the Kepler law, you know it. Because force is like acceleration. If you try to make a typical acceleration of the planet, it would be something like the typical distance divided by the square of the typical time. But the third law of Kepler tells you that the cube of the distance is like the square of a time. So this distance divided by time square would be proportional to constant divided by r square. So what is remarkable is not to find this law in over r square. What is remarkable is to think that there is a law, a unified explanation. So that was a remarkable achievement of Newton. And of course, he was very, very proud. At the same time, understanding that this was going to cause a lot of problems. Let us mention, before turning to the problems, that, of course, this was coming with the birth of infinitesimal calculus, study of trends and slopes, and differential equations, which are this idea that you can solve important problems of physics by solving equations about trends, about differ differential equations. And it's all in this big book, one of the most famous in history of sciences. Usually it is referred to as Principia Mathematica, but in fact, the whole title is important. Every word counts. It's about philosophy, it's about nature, it's about big principles, and it's about mathematics at the same time. But where is the problem? Newton understands there is a catch there. If it's a universal law, then everybody has to interact with everybody. When the sun interacts with one planet, Newton shows it will satisfy the Kepler laws by solving this problem with the sun and one planet. And if it was that each planet interacts with just the sun, we would find again the beautiful Kepler picture. But the planets will also interact with each other if it's a general law of mass interacts with mass. And there we are in big trouble. It's not even periodic motion again. No ellipses again. Nothing that you can prove as an exact shape. It all becomes very moving. And Newton discovers that he's not even sure his equations uh, can prevent some catastrophe to occur. The resulting behavior, actually, when you take into account the interactions between the planets could be very, very complex. Let me, as an, exp as an illustration, and because it will be useful also for the discussion later, show here a small video by astronomer John Dubinsky. We'll see about the behavior of galaxies, so galaxies, think of it as a bunch of stars, over very large periods of times. Let's see how it works. Complicated, right? In fact, when you see this, you don't even know what you can say that would be intelligent. Like, even what is the question that I should ask if I want to study this? <laughs> Which is a relevant problem. And here, there is no more physics than just gravitation. Just the simple Newton law. But because there are all these interactions between many, many bodies, who knows what will occur? Let's see how people say this is what will occur in a couple billion years with our galaxy. It will be much small, slower time scale, of course. <laughs> it's beautiful, right? So nothing more than the Newton law. 
And what can we say? Fortunately, in some sense, uh, the solar system is not of this kind. And there is some extra information that you can use that will change everything and give you some hope to ask an intelligent question. Is that the solar system is not like this bunch of stars. Solar system has one body which is very particular and that's the sun. To appreciate how much it has important, let's first make a digression to marvel about the range of various scales in the universe. These are the planets we are used to, Earth and Venus, sometimes they are referred to as the twin sisters in the solar system. And when you compare to Jupiter, you feel really Jupiter is an impressive thing, you know, the whole Earth would fit in this hurricane on the surface of Jupiter. And with the planes nowadays, we have some kind of understanding of the size of the Earth. You can travel, uh, make the half of the Earth in just one day and so on, but size of Jupiter is still not in our range of intuition. And then you discover the Sun, and that's the Earth compared to the Sun. It makes you feel really miserable. And uh, then, by the way, you discover the sun is not a big star when you compare it to Arcturus. And even Arcturus is not a big, really big star. When you go to that scale, yeah, this is the sun, if you see this one pixel here. And so that's one amazing thing about the universe, such diversity of scales. And by the way, one amazing thing about mathematics, it allows us to handle all these scales without any problem, just writing down equations and so on. But back to our problem with the solar system. In the solar system, it's clear from this picture that the sun is like uh, making, well, solar system is, first approximation is just the sun. And then the rest is tiny perturbations so whichever equation you have, you can first neglect the influence of anything that is not the sun, and then consider the influence of the sun as a small perturbation. And here we arrive at the problem of the stability of solar system, as it was understood already by Newton, one of the oldest problems in mathematical physics. Take some masses, and the first one is the mass of the sun, much larger than all the other masses. And look for an equation for the positions of the various planets. So X1 is the position of the Sun, X2 is the position of, say, Mercury, X3 the position of Venus, and so on. And write the equations of Newton of universal gravitation applied to this system. Put some satellites, if you want, put the Moon, and so on, Assume maybe if you want to simplify that the orbits are almost circular initially, which is grossly false for Pluto, but not so bad for uh, many of the planets in the solar system. And here you have an equation which is well written and which in principle should allow you to predict the later positions of the planets and the sun. And ask yourself, is the picture that we have nowadays of the sun and planets a stable picture? In millions of years, would it be about the same? And our grand, 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 etc. children, if uh, human race still exists, will they still observe the planets as we see them? And that's a problem as debated since the time of Newton. Newton understood there was this problem of accumulation of errors, of course. Even if you have an equation such that the trend is to be stable except for a small perturbation, and this small perturbation, let's call it epsilon, it's a very small thing. If you wait for a large time, these small errors will accumulate and accumulate and disturb the whole thing. Like if your bank account loses one per thousand every day, on the scale of the day you don't see any noticeable difference, but after a thousand days, there is a big difference on your bank account. So the typical time in which a perturbation should have effects is like the inverse of the size of the perturbation. 
Now, in the case of the solar system, epsilon should be like one thousandth, indeed. That's kind of the ratio between the mass of the planets and the mass of the sun. Typical time scale should be something like the year. So here it suggests that in thousand years there should be dramatic change of the positions of the planets due to these small perturbations. This Newton did not believe, also because we know from ancient observation that thousands of years ago it was not so different from what it is now. And Newton concluded that it was not just the equations which were at play here, but also some maybe divine intervention, helping stabilization. What Newton precisely had in mind is still subject of debate, but that was kind of the idea and the start of big debate with Leibniz. Anyway, it took about 100 years before mathematicians uh, mastered this problem and showed that the critical time scale, due to the structure of the equation, is much larger, not one over epsilon, but typically one over epsilon square, or even more under some circumstances. And uh, uh, this is related to some simplification that I'll try to explain in very simple words. Imagine first that this is the sun, this is the earth, this is Jupiter. Scales are grossly wrong, but never mind. And of course, it takes a larger time for Jupiter to go around the sun. Imagine if the Earth was doing this motion very quickly over the, around the Sun and Jupiter is almost still. Then the influence of Jupiter on the distance to the Sun is what? When the Earth is here, it will be attracted by Jupiter, so getting a little bit further away from the Sun. But when it is on the other side, it will be the contrary, get a little bit closer to the Sun. So maybe it will compensate over a period. Now, in fact, that is true even if there is not much difference, not so much difference between the time scale of the year of the Earth and the year of Jupiter. It's true if there is no resonance, that is, no particular pattern between the trajectory of Jupiter and the trajectory of the Earth, and that, for instance, when the Earth is in this position, sometimes Jupiter will be here, sometimes it will be at another place, etc. No correlation between these respective positions. And then sometimes Jupiter will drive the Earth away from the Sun, sometimes it will drive it closer to the Sun, and on the average, it should compensate. It took quite a lot of mathematical effort to the French astronomers of the late 18th century to show this picture. Lagrange and Laplace in particular arrived at this. And they showed that after a time scale like 1 over epsilon, you have almost no influence. It was the birth of perturbative methods, which is a way to investigate mathematical problems in which there is a small parameter involved uh, translating that there is some perturbation. And they predicted this long time stability, invariance of the typical distance between the planets and the sun over time scales of the order of a million years. This was remarkable for the, that time. All the more remarkable by the way that observations over long times were suggesting kind of the contrary. You know, there was, uh, if you look at the distance between Jupiter and the sun, it seemed to be always I guess it's slowly decreasing. The Scott, Scott Tremaine here will correct me if I'm getting it in the wrong way. And the uh, uh, distance between Saturn and the Sun was slowly increasing, and it was so for hundreds of years. Actually, they understood it was a 900-year period of this due to some almost resonance between the orbits of Jupiter and Saturn. And after 900 years, it would be the contrary trend that would be observed. You know, we used to say that when theory and observations don't match, the theory has it wrong. Here it was the contrary, the theory was right, contrary to the uh, observations in a way. 
And anyway, Lagrange and Laplace also confirmed the Newton law and defined the Laplacian determinism, this idea that you can predict the future if you have the right equation and the right initial configuration. So many developments from just one simple, so it seemed, problem. And that was not the end of it by a long shot. Let's now move to the 19th century when Poincaré studies the restricted three-body problem. So Poincaré says, okay, maybe it's stable over a million years, but what about billion years? What about infinite time? Can we prove that it's stable? And he understands it's so difficult to study it on the solar system, so studies it on a reduced system, assuming there is a sun maybe, Maybe that's uh, Jupiter, and let's assume for a start that the Earth has a mass which is completely neglectable in front of the masses of Jupiter and the Sun. As a first step, he believes he can prove the stability for this system, and that typically it will be stable for all times, and the typical situation for very large negative times, for very large positive time, will be the same when the mass is small. This is related to a dramatic episode in the story of sciences. When Poincaré was answering a mathematical competition hosted by King Oscar of Sweden, and uh, with this stability result, uh, obtained the prize, big money, world fame, recognition outside the sphere of mathematics, all the newspapers in France talking of the genius of Poincaré and so on. And, uh, then it is discovered when the time comes of checking the results and so on that there is a small mistake someplace and uh, actually the small mistake becomes a big mistake and one day Poincaré understands everything is wrong. In his paper, which was a problem since the prize was already given to him, the money had been given and the paper had been published. And it was uh, uh, also uh, remarkable when Mita Gleffer managed to get back all the copies of the paper writing, you know, very small problem, small typo, sent back to me. <laughs> I will send you a new copy and so on. Destroyed them all, except for a few of them, which are still in Mita Gleffer Institute nowadays. And, uh, and by the way, Poincaré paid for the expenses, and this cost more than the money he had obtained with the prize. And Poincaré was able to repair everything with just one change. This conclusion was now the opposite <laughs> of what he thought. And so Poincaré arrived at this conclusion that the solar system has to be unstable because he finds this possibility this very uh, interesting uh, possibility that a small change will produce huge changes at later periods. And uh, it was a phenomenon, so phenomenon was known as homoclinic, inter homoclinic intersection to simplify things grossly. Let's assume this red curve stands for the positions of the system very far in the past. And this blue curve is like positions of the system very far in the future. And whenever the two curves cross, it is a stability point. And Poincaré believed that the two curves were the same, so everything was, was stable. And he discovers that it's impossible to predict where the two curves will cross. It's so complicated. It looks like this. And he says, try to represent the picture formed by these two curves and their intersections in infinite number, each of which corresponds to a stable solution. These intersections are like a kind of mesh of uh, a tissue of network with mesh that are infinitely small. Each of these curves can never uh, intersect itself, but has to fold itself in a complex way so that it intersects infinitely many times every mesh in the network. I don't even try to, to draw this picture. So complicated, so impossible to predict in practice when there is stability and room for a lot of unstability. And this was the beginning of the theory of chaos, which would 
develop later and makes its way after the works of Birkhoff, Lorenz, and so on, showing that in many systems, there is something similar to what Poincaré had predicted. It's impossible to predict the long-time behavior, long-time position of a system, and small change, very, very small change in the conditions may end up in huge differences much later. Uh, Poincaré tells us maybe a small, very small change in the positions of the, of the planets, so small that we can't detect it, will end up with a huge difference in the large time behavior of the solar system. This was the picture up to the middle of the 20th century. And then was a new thunder strike. 1954, Kolmogorov states a theorem which had tremendous influence. The beginning of the so-called kolmogorov arnold moser theory. And it says, roughly speaking, take a system which you can completely solve, completely integrate, and perturb it. For instance, take the solar system as Kepler understood it and perturb it with the Newton law of interaction. And then choose an initial configuration, see, of the planets, randomly. Then with high probability, you will stay on a stable trajectory. So you cannot predict if it will be unstable or stable, but the probability that it remains stable will be large. That's the Kolmogorov theorem, and it works if the perturbation is really small. Uh, let's make a digression. Okay, let's first ask whether it applies to the solar system, and the answer is no. And in fact, the Kolmogorov theorem almost never applies to any physical system because the perturbations which you need is so, so small that in practice it will be unrealistic. In spite of that, it did change our vision of the world, brought back the belief in a stable solar system. You know, maybe the theorem does not apply, but it gives the idea. There is some new hope for stability, and the theorem was so beautiful that you really want to believe in it. It was also the start of an important, elegant, active mathematical field on its own. For instance, this theory was one of the inspirations between what was later called the Nash-Moser theory, very powerful method in analysis to tackle perturbative problems. Let's make a digression. This will be the most advanced mathematical part of the talk. Let's draw a random number. What does it mean, take a random number? Ah, not so easy. Let's assume we take a random number on the zero one interval. It means the probability that this number arrives in the range AB is B minus A. With this definition, the probability that your number is rational, that is, it's a fraction, is zero. It's not small, it's really zero. Still, rational numbers are so many, and we know they are dense, meaning with rational numbers, you can approximate any number. For instance, pi is close to the fraction 22 over 7, or close to this big fraction, or whatever fraction. So these rational numbers, there are so many, and still there are so few since the probability to get one is zero. Some numbers, however, are badly approximated by rational numbers. Oh gosh. It means that if you try to approximate these numbers by a fraction, the quality of the approximation will be bad. It will be at least like some inverse power of the denominator here. So no matter how you do it, you cannot have a very precise approximation by rational number. And these are the numbers. These numbers are very numerous. Actually, you have probability one to pick up one of these numbers. And these are the ones that the Kolmogorov theory likes. So in the Kolmogorov theory, you don't like the rational numbers. They correspond to instability. For instance, if the ratio of two periods is rational, this will be an unstable situation. 
but what you like are the numbers which are very badly approximated by rational numbers. And in a beautiful coincidence, in this sense, the number which is most difficult to approximate by rational number is the golden ratio. So the most stable configuration of three body will be one in which the ratio of the two periods, say of the planets around the sun, would be exactly the golden ratio. It's funny because, you know, golden ratio, people have all this fantasy about it's the perfect number, it's so harmonious, all the time, very often you get these crackpots wanting to do all kinds of things with the golden ratio. Once I even received an email from some guy who wanted to start, make a startup that would be some kind of dating website in which the ability of people to have love at first sight would be measured by golden ratio in the proportions of their face and it would be a hit and so on. So we have all these crazy fantasies about golden ratio and here we see in this complicated problem, golden ratio does play a role and is associated to stability. Ah, it's nice coincidence. So let's go back to the solar system now. Now with Kolmogorov we understood that uh, there is maybe high probability of stability and this was the belief for a few decades. And then a new swing of the public opinion of mathematicians working on this. In the 1980s, so uh, Jacques Lascar, <coughs> Scott Tremaine and others ran the race for numerical simulation over tens of millions of years. First for asteroids and for the whole system. Choice of numerical methods is crucial here. You have to be very, very careful how you approximate. Jacques Lascar, for instance, wrote down a simplified perturbation system of 150,000 terms, polynomial of degree five in 16 variables. That was a simplification, you know. Describing the evolution of the orbits in the Kepler way, taking into account the corrections. Anyway, in the end, it was found by all these people that there is considerable increase of uncertainty over the positions of the planets over time. And typical time separation scale, like 10 to 12 million years. For instance, this formula, take two masses in solar system at kind of random places, initially some distance between them. After a certain time t, where t is in millions of years, the multiplication of the uncertainty is like 10 to the t over 10. Meaning what? Well, suppose you have an initial error of 15 meters initially. After 10 millions of years, 150 meters, nothing. After 100 millions of years, the error becomes of the same order of magnitude as the position of the distance between the Earth and the Sun. Huge change. So after a few million years, no problem in prediction. But after 100 million years, no way. Actually, latest developments by Lascar were saying that the real threshold is like 60 something million years and finding that the most, the biggest source of instability in solar systems seems to be two asteroids in the belt of asteroids between Mars and Jupiter. Their name is Ceres and Vesta. Total mass is like one billionth of the mass of the sun or something like this. But their orbits has, are such that they cause a lot of perturbation on the position of the Earth, for instance, after just 60 million years. Crazy to think that such a small difference can make a huge change. So if uh, Ceres and Vesta, you make uh, an error of a few centimeters on their position at some time, it will change the positions of the Earth after 60 million years. And in this sense, Poincaré was right. What are the conclusions? Solar system is poorly predictable, that's what they tell us. You can solve the stability only probabilistically. And very importantly, it was going back and forth between mathematics and physics for several centuries, with new physical theories, new mathematical theories. Uh, Lascar tells us 
maybe it's about 1% chance that we have see a major catastrophe in the solar system before the end of the solar system, but such an event probably occurred before, and he summarized it all in this small video. Due to planetary perturbations, the orbits precess and are deformed. You see here, these are the orbits of the planets, or oh, Sun, okay, so Mercury, Venus, uh, the Earth, Mars, and so on. Time here is in thousands of years. See, the orbits are close to coplanar, to be in the same plane, but not exactly. Nothing particular happens in the first hundreds of millions of years, but this is not good, you see, after <laughs> several billions of years. There is a small chance that chaotic diffusion destabilizes the orbits of the small planets, Mercury, Mars, Venus, and the Earth. Collisions become possible, yes. Oh, this is not good at all. <laughs> so Mars may collide the Earth and even Venus and the Earth, the twin sisters, may annihilate each other. <laughs> nice, right? Okay, of course, this is an artist view. Uh, it's very good to use this video in high schools because you can test their understanding of uh, telluric motions, you know, tectonics, if they are able to tell you that this picture will not be what the Earth looks like in a couple of billions of years. <laughs> but it's an artist's view, so here it's represented with the same shape of the continents as nowadays. Okay. So, this was for the solar system. So much science, so much mathematics, in just the study of the solar system. And here we understand, of course, on the one hand, uh, it is good for understanding the universe, but also focusing on this particular problem was the birth of side scientific progress, which some people would say was much more important than just the study of the solar system. Let's now turn to the next scale. After you understand the solar system, Turn to the galaxy. What can you see of the stability of the galaxy? Galaxy can be thousands of billions of stars. You saw how it was tricky for just eight planets or nine planets and the sun. And it took people more than 300 years to arrive at something reasonable. So what about the thousands of billions of stars? Maybe it is much, much more tricky again. But there is a new phenomenon now. The fact that there are so many stars gives the possibility for a completely mathematical approach to this question. And that's the statistical approach. Taking inspiration from the great works of Maxwell and Boltzmann in the 19th century and Vlasov in the 20th century, they were trying to study gas, like the air which is around us, using the fact that it's made of so many billions of billions of molecules. Similarly, maybe we can use statistics for a galaxy, at least as a first approximation. And let's forget about the positions and the velocities of all the stars and just focus on the statistics. Just as if you are doing demography, you don't care about the life expectancy expectation of this guy and that guy, or whether this guy will marry and have children and whatever. You care of the statistics. There is this percentage of people, this birth rate, this immigration rate, etc. And then you can predict the statistics of a whole country while you are unable to predict the statistics of one family. And it's the same. It is very difficult to predict the long-term behavior of 10 stars maybe, but with 1,000 billion stars, it may be easier because you have statistics. So let's apply to the stars the formalism which was developed for the gas. 
and have this kind of curve, which is like demographic curve, but telling about the statistics of the velocities and positions of the stars in your galaxy. Can you say something intelligent? You need some equation. There was Newton equations to study for the solar system. So now you need the statistical version of the Newton equations. 1866 comes out the first such equation. Actually first written down by Maxwell, then developed by Morseban. Still mysterious today, but very much useful for engineers, for physicists, for mathematicians. I did my PhD on this equation and worked on this for many years. And this is a Boltzmann equation written in a special case, like you imagine a billiard game with many, many particles bumping into each other like the molecules of the gas around us, like the molecules in the air. Boltzmann studies this equation and that's the equation which allows you to predict the evolution of the statistics. How many fast particles will be there, how many slow particles and so on. And Boltzmann understands that a certain key quantity that you can construct from the statistics will give you a lot of information about the long time behavior of this system. Here's my paying tribute to Boltzmann's grave in Vienna. This was in 2006. And uh, uh, on the grave of Boltzmann, is written this famous formula about the so-called entropy. S is K log W, meaning when you have a system, macroscopic system that you're observing with some uncertainty, you know some things about the system, there are some unknowns, you do the list of every possible state of the system, all the uncertainty, you take the logarithm, which is like the number of digits, and this will give you a, a number expressing the disorder that there is, the chaos that there is in this system in some sense. S equals K log W. And this looks like an abstract formula because how do you compute this number? But Boltzmann gave the formula to compute this number in terms of the statistics of the gas. And with this at hand, a formula to compute the disorder of the gas and the evolution of the gas, you can start doing predictions. By the way, and for the record, uh, how was this picture taken? So I was in this conference 2006, 20, it was uh, the 100 years of the death of Boltzmann. I was there as specialist of the Boltzmann equation. I knew that the grave was there with the famous formula, S is K log W, so I went there, arrived there in the evening and said, gosh, what will I do? It's a huge cemetery, the central cemetery of Vienna. There is no indication. So I want to ask my way. There was this family sitting on a bench. I asked them, do you know where I can find a map of the cemetery? No map. Who are you looking for? And I say proudly, you know, Boltzmann, for me, was almost part of the family after so many years working on this equation. Boltzmann, I thought, maybe he heard of this guy. And the father looked at me in the eyes and said, with shiny look, ha ha, S is K log W. <laughs> See the great destiny of the formula becoming some kind of password in the cemetery <laughs> for people in some kind of cult. Anyway, what does Boltzmann do with the formula? Boltzmann shows that entropy, this disorder, will systematically increase and he computes the rate of increase and this shows that the gas becomes more and more disordered. To be as disordered as can possibly be in the long run. And what is as can possibly be? What is the maximal disorder that is possible? 
It's an exercise in mathematics. You compute and you find that the solution is that the velocities should be around a curve which is like the Gauss curve, this bell curve which is very familiar to people uh, in statistics. A universal law. And then you see how much stability there is in the Boltzmann equation because of the statistics. With a few bodies, it's associated with unstability, unknown, but when it's statistics, it's very stable. And we know in the long run it will be Gaussian. As the air in this room, if we could measure the velocities of the molecules around this, we would see a beautiful Gauss curve. Then seeing this picture, you would say, now I get it for the problem of stability of the galaxy. It's easier than the problem of the solar system. Sometimes there will be some interactions complicated between the stars, but in the long run, it will turn to a Gaussian curve in the velocity variable. You can show also it should become kind of uniformly spread around the galaxy, maybe. And this certainly was the view for some time. Thanks to the statistics, Galaxies are stable, thanks to statistics and entropy. And it was all changed when Lyndon Bell, uh, in the 60s, pointed out, maybe galaxies are stable. They often appear to be in some kind of equilibrium. But it's not due to Boltzmann, it's not due to disorder, it's not due to entropy increase. Entropy increase is too slow to explain this, and if you would wait for this Gaussian behavior to take off, you would have to wait thousands of billions of years. So it has to be from another physical phenomenon. And Lyndon Bell comes up with this concept of violent relaxation, beautiful oxymoron, that there is a stability due to violent phenomena that is not due to entropy and occurring on a time scale which is so small, so short, that the disorder does not increase. N nobody really knows what is violent relaxation. But it's this idea that you can have equilibration without entropy increase. And for realistic systems, it's still a big challenge for mathematicians to explain. To convince people, Lyndon Bell argues using an analogy with a phenomenon which had been uncovered more than 15 years ago by Lef Landau about plasma physics. What, first, what is plasma? Plasma is a state of matter in which electrons have been separated from the nuclei. In the universe, it's a very frequent state of matter, but around us, it's very rare, and it was discovered much later after, of course, liquid, solid, and gas. It can uh, appear in many different shapes. This is a picture from Wikipedia. And there is a common mathematical framework for plasma. And you can write in the most simple way the equation associated with plasma dynamics for the electrons in statistical form in a certain equation which is related to the Boltzmann equation, but not exactly the same. And this equation for plasmas is the same as the equation for galaxies, in a way. Beautiful feature of mathematics, by the way, that I, I was studying, it doesn't care of scales, and that's amazing. Same equation will apply in one situation in which the unit is an electron, another situation in which the unit is a star. Think of the tremendous difference of scale between electron and star. And still it's the same equation apart from basically the change of sign. Because electrons repel each other while stars attract each other. Apart from that, the same equation. And so anything you know about the plasma, you can hope has some translation in the case of galaxies and vice versa. And Landau had shown what mathematicians would say is dynamical stability of homogeneous equilibria of the Vlasov-Poisson equation. Looks like barbarian for non-mathematicians. So let's just say, in plain words, Landau discovers if you take a plasma which is at rest, so that if you measure the electric 
current in there, you find zero rest. And then you perturb it by applying some small electric field, which will move the electrons around and make some electric field and leave it uh, on its own. Then spontaneously, the electric field will decay as if there was a friction force preventing this electric force to remain. And that was paradoxical because no collisions in the plasma, no friction. So how is it that you have this decay without the disorder increase, without the entropy increase? And Lindenberg argued it's the same thing in the galaxy. There will be this decay of the gravitation force that you feel typically, even though it's a perfect world. This was not so easy. However, to apply to the equation, and Landau established this by cheating, and Lyndon Bell cheated also. It's okay to cheat, uh, I mean, as long as you're aware of it, but it still gives some open problems. The biggest cheating in the Landau computation, the only major cheating, was that Landau changes the nonlinear equation for the linearized equation. Linear is simpler than nonlinear, and you have a lot of mathematics that you can use for the linearized equation, which you cannot use for the nonlinear equation. And we used to think many problems that if you are close to equilibrium, you can change nonlinearity for linear equation. But when you think of how to justify it, it's a huge mess. It's a huge mess, and there was some controversy about this. Actually, if you read in the physical literature, mathematical literature, uh, as early as 1960, you see people arguing that you should not be allowed to linearize this equation, that you will obtain results which are physically wrong, and so on. And uh, controversy goes around. I will not say that it's a heated controversy, but you find arguments on one side and the other. In some sense, we solved this problem together with Clément Mouault in 2009, and uh, most of this was uh, done when I was here visiting the Institute. Clément Mouault was in Paris, and we were working over the internet like crazy. Conclusion was, yes, Landau damping does hold, even in the nonlinear case, even for, pertur for perturbations of homogeneous equilibria in the model of gravitation that I described. And there was a huge world between the linear treatment and the nonlinear treatment. And uh, in a way, it was solving the problem is it allowed to cheat or not? But it was more than this. And let us state that relation between mathematics and physics is very strong. Some people have this idea in physics that the physicist has the insight, and then the mathematician will check it and prove it, but that's it, just for the sake of rigor. That's not the case. When you are doing mathematical physics, you're also wanting to get new insights that the mathematics will reveal and which are so subtle that the physical analysis will not be enough. In this case, the main, one of the main new insights, which was a complete surprise for us, is that working on this nonlinear Landau damping, we found that in the mathematical world, it was closely related to two other paradoxical phenomena in classical mechanics. First one is the one I already described by Kolmogorov, this idea that sometimes the system may remain very well ordered without apparent constraint. You will say, but this was for Newton's equations, for solar system, it was a completely different physical system. That's right. And the connection is not at all at the level of the physical system. The connection is at the level of mathematics. And the other phenomenon it was related to was the so-called plasma echo experiment, beautiful experiment that I will describe shortly. Take a plasma, make a plasma in your lab. So zero electric field, plasma at rest, and then 
make a short impulse with a small electric field so that the plasma is unrest now. There will be some electric field and the electric field will go down and disappear after some time so you don't measure anything. And now you send a second pulse, another electric field, for just a fraction of a second, and you see what the result will be. And it has to be some electric field with a certain typical spatial frequency, not the same. And then you wait and do nothing. And while the plasma was at rest, it will spontaneously become at unrest again, and you will see some response of the plasma. So you send one pulse, then you send another pulse, and the plasma reacts back after the second pulse. Just once, after the electric field disappears again. It looks weird. It's known as the echo, because it's like an echo of the system. Shows you that plasma is a tricky system. Shows you also that there is some delay in the reaction of the plasma. And what we understood is that this delay is key to the stability. Without this, there was no way the nonlinear stability would have worked. So this is new insight and was not at all uh, there, either in Linden Bell or in Landau. So in a few minutes, I explained to you the theorem and the insight, but it took hard work, months and months, uh, uh, Robert was uh, mentioning about the stay here and how it was. It was like, like crazy, thinking one thing, then being mistaken, mistake again. We mathematicians spend our life doing mistakes, no? And correcting them. And uh, fighting against the equations, of course. Uh, the paper is more than 100 pages of computations like this. And computations is not the hardest part. The hardest part is to get the reasoning right. And uh, I did uh, tell this story also for broad audience. This is the subject of the book, which is now out, available for a small prize <laughs> there outside. In a French version, it's called Living Theorem. When I made the step to tell the story, like for broad audience, but without insisting on the science, actually telling much less than I told you in terms of science, insisting only on the human side of it, which makes it so fascinating, the life of a researcher. The adventure, the fact that you never know where you're going to, the mistakes, the setbacks, the victories, the exchanges, the excitement, the many, many versions, the communications with each other, when you're presenting this for first time in front of the audience, when you're correcting the mistake, when the audience is not happy, when people get angry at you, this is not the right theorem and your assumption is wrong, when they are nice and say, that's exactly what you want to prove and so on. It's uh, uh, full of adventure in the end. Of course, when we publish the paper, we forget about all this and publish only the final result and we tell our people, look, it's so simple. I will explain you, <laughs> a child could understand, and so forth. So I was uh, telling all this story. I also take the daring step of uh, showing how we speak to each other, showing the technical things, like developing, explaining, yeah, I worked on this synthetical notion of bounded below which curvature in measured metric spaces, which are complete and locally compact looks like barbarian, and, but you can also think it's like poetry. Uh, many people uh, love this. Actually, there is this famous quote by Hawking that you should never put uh, mathematical equations in a book because it, each equation divides by two the number of readers. If this was really true, there would not have been even one reader for the book, just a few molecules of, of reader. But actually, the book was a success. It, uh, with the, with the, from the book, I got more money the year it was out than my professor's salary. <laughs> you will say, okay, it's a French professor's salary. It doesn't count. 
still, still. So back to the conclusions, back to the mathematical conclusion, this was digression about, of course, the adventure that there is in mathematical research. Here we had a long mathematical proof introducing new ideas, new points of view, ending up a 50 years of theoretical controversy. And first result showing that nonlinear relaxation of a system is possible without disorder increase. So here, relaxation is due to confinement and mixing and regularity. Just one thing about the mixing. Mixing is worth. Let's look at, uh, let's imagine we are observing an ant's nest with many, many ants going in all directions. One thing that is striking about ants is when you look at one ant, it seems like it's very determined, it's going in one way and nothing can stop it, right? Even if there is another ant coming, it will go and go and go. So if you look at one ant, it looks like something like deterministic and changing. But maybe the whole nest, you are seeing some crowd which looks stable as a fluid. That's because they are going in all kinds of directions. And it's, uh, in some sense, stability through the mixing of the various directions, various speeds, not because of the influence of the ants on each other. That's one way to see it. That's one way to see it. Let's conclude by saying that as any good result, it acquires a life on its own and uh, uh, escapes the control of the people who did it. And in particular, so the book is called Birth of the Theorem. If it's born, it means that there are adventures after. In particular, that people should use your theorem, simplify your theorem, change your theorem, etc. The most striking development in, after the theorem was published was a beautiful contribution by Bedrosian and Masmoudi. This was not far in Courant Institute, showing the stability of the so-called quet flow in fluid mechanics. What does it mean? It has nothing to do with stars. Take a fluid on very, a very thin layer of fluid such that it looks two-dimensional and take a flow which is in this way. You see up it goes in this way and down it goes in the opposite way and it's like a linear profile of the velocities and take it to be infinite uh, like this. So it's a very nice flow and ask yourself, if I make a small perturbation, you take your finger and a tiny perturbation of this flow, what will occur? And take the simplest flow that you can imagine, incompressible, non-viscous, what will occur? Will it again arrive to some stable flow or will the perturbation continue like this forever and ever? Has been a debate for more than 100 years with big physicists like Kelvin and others thinking about it. And they understood it was very tricky. And it was solved only a couple of years ago by Bedrosian and Masmoudi using the techniques that uh, Clément and I developed to tackle the nonlinear Landau damping, adding also other techniques on their own, very clever, and uh, settling the problem. Yes, it will be stable under the right conditions. And uh, this is important also in this picture to insist again to make people interested in going into research. Research is such a huge collaborative process. What you do is never the end. It will be used by somebody else. Your result will be developed and some people will go and do better than what you did and you will be proud of this also. And let's add finally to saying that even if, you are, uh, even if I am excited about this, I have to recognize it's just a droplet in the ocean of unknown. These are nice results maybe, but still tiny what happens in a fully, in a flow that is uh, turbulent, nobody knows. And remember the small movie I showed about the galaxy going around. What do we know about this? Nothing. 
we only solve the problem when it's a small perturbation of homogeneous, so almost homogeneous and tiny perturbation. It was already so difficult, but the real difficult problems are still out there, and in this field, as in many others, we can see knowledge as a whole ocean of unknown and a few islands of knowledge, which makes these islands even more precious. Thank you for your attention.